Hey there, everybody. PT Pop here with all four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And today on a mind revolution, I'm going to talk about how the music business works. Stay tuned. The record companies don't look at these people, bands, as humans. They look at them as a product, a mass produced product that they can put on an assembly line, put different clothing and hair and music on them, send them down the line, finish them off, and roll them out, uh, backed by you know, millions of dollars of marketing money and advertising and PR. Would you like fries with that? Would you like fries with that? So for those of you that don't know me, I've been playing guitar for over 44 years. I've written 150 songs. I've released five CDs of original music. I have performed in front of just a few people in coffee shops and also in front of a couple hundred people on stages. I've worked in professional recording studios and I've been around the music world, actively involved in the music world for about 30 years. And I wanted to tell you that because um, I wanted to give you my background as a musician and an artist. I, I played the guitar fairly well. I can write a good tune. I've written some interesting songs and I've been around a lot of people who work in the music business. And I bring this up because I realize it, the average person, most of you, have no idea how the music business really works. Now, granted, I'm not famous. i am never come close to being famous. I have no regrets about not being famous. I have no qualms with it. I'm very happy with who I am as a person. Very happy with who I am as an artist. Now, I wanted to make this video because I wanted this video to be something that I feel very passionate about because this is in response to a uh, defense of myself and the host of YouTube channel, Sage of Quay Radio, Mike Williams. And this is in regarding our discussions between the two of us and, uh, you know, with himself and his own program about the possibility of the rock group, the Beatles, being the first boy band in the history of music. And the unlikely possibility that they actually wrote their own songs. Now, now Mike did not put me up to this. I, I am in no way, he didn't call me up and say, hey, you know, can you make a video to, to back me up here, Peter? No, th this was my own idea. And, but Mike, Mike is a guy, is a very genuine guy. Uh, Mike has been one of the most generous, straightforward people I have met in recent memory. But his insight into the music business and the possibility of the Beatles being the first boy band who may not have written their own songs has been presented to the world without malice. And, you know, he's presented his objective, logical, and unemotional approach about his theory that the Beatles may not have been the first musical group or, or the musical group we thought they were. He's done it in a very objective manner. and. I bring this up because I personally have received some very harsh messages on my videos where I talk with Mike about this and where we speak about the subject of the Beatles being a fake band. And some say, some have said that Mike and I are bonkers, that we're crazy, and that we're jealous of the Beatles, <laughs> jealous of their fame, their fortune. And while I can't speak on behalf of Mike, I can tell you that on behalf of myself, I'm not jealous in any way, shape, or form of anything the Beatles have or what they've accomplished. I'm not at all envious of their wives, their money, their houses, their cars, their fame. And, and I can tell you why this is. Because over the years, I've obtained something that money can't buy. You know, you can't, can't buy me love, right? Over the years, I've found something far more precious than any of that. I found peace of mind and I like who I am as a person and as an artist. And I wouldn't trade that for anybody. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for any money. I wouldn't trade it for buckets of gold. I wouldn't trade it for any, any model or woman or anything. I have found something without fame and fortune and money that has brought me great peace of mind. And to say that I'm jealous of four guys who more than likely were propped up and used by the record business and the recording business to promote an agenda 
is just ludicrous. It's crazy. So what I want to talk to you about today is about the music business and why the theory that the Beatles may not be who we all think they were, how, how it's really based in sound thought and you know, logic. Now, the music business, for those of you that don't know, is a very dark and insidious industry that is trying to do one thing and one thing only. They're trying to make money, lots and lots of money. And that's all they think about. That's all they want. That's all that motivates them. They don't care about the people that bring in the doors. They don't care about the people they use and throw aside. They don't care about their lives, previous or past. They look at this as how to make money. Now, the popular story of all four Beatles being geniuses is, to say at the very least, ridiculous. It's far-fetched to say, you know, at the least. It's, it's just far-fetched. Now, now before, I, before I continue, let me ask you this. If you're, if you're interested in helping me promote my channel and support it, please check out my Patreon channel, my Patreon site. I'll put a link to it in the description here. For just $5, $5 membership, I've just got one level. You can get insider information. You can get behind the scenes videos and shots and stories of my productions here at Skating Bear Studios while I make these videos. So I appreciate your support. Statistically speaking, what are the chances that four guys, who all just happen to grow up near each other, who all just happen to meet and just happen to create a band, and all of them just happen to be genius artists, none of whom were good musicians, and they just happened to stumble into a recording contract when a rec with a record label whose producer didn't like them, their sound or their equipment, and a band who didn't have an original song that he could re tolerate other than Love Me Do. What's, what's the likelihood that, that it just happened that within two years of signing with EMI that they just happened to write some of the best pop rock tunes in history when there weren't even known the songwriters. What's the likelihood of that? You see, the music business isn't looking for geniuses. They're not. The music business is looking for young, impressionable, easily manipulated, desperate entertainers who can be shaped and molded into a marketable product that will make them millions and millions of dollars, hopefully. Geniuses are seen as being difficult to work with. They are preconceived and they're perceived as being prima donnas, and they're usually out of the box thinkers who are considered mavericks, hard to control. Geniuses are unpredictable, people who make waves and make their own rules. Geniuses make it difficult for record companies to conduct business in a quick and efficient manner. Geniuses, in turn, will affect cost the record company lots of money due to contract negotiations, production costs, and more. And geniuses just basically cost the record companies a lot of money, give them a lot of grief. See, the music business is a very dark and insidious place. And they're, they're, they're going to do this. The music business will look at a prospective band or singer or an entertainer and say to themselves, how can I make money off of them? Will they make money for my label? Are they marketable to a large audience? And if not, can they be turned into a marketable product? Will the product that we shape them into influence the masses? See, you've got to, got to get a huge group of people to be interested in your product. All right? So you've, you've got to... You've got to come up with a product. The people go, I've got to have that. Then, then after they ask, ask all these questions, they, they begin the molding process. See, think of it this way. I'm going to compare the Beatles before they were famous to, like, let's say each of us, any of us, wanted. We, we've always loved to make cars. All right, we're, we're fascinated with the engineering process. We're kind of uh, half-assed engineers, and we decided to make a car. And we go into our garage and we create a car, and we throw it together. We 
with the assembly process who we have. Maybe we have the next door neighbor come over who loves to drink beer and he can kind of uh, understand the basic mechanics of auto engineering. Throw a car together in our garage and then we roll it out into our driveway. I mean, what do you think the chances are that that car would stand up? The wheels would probably fall off, the doors would fall down. You would probably, you probably couldn't even drive it halfway down the block before it fell apart. And that's, that's the comparison making to the Beatles. The Beatles were this thrown together band that weren't very good. And how did they go from being this garage band, basically a bar band, into an over, literally overnight success with number one hits and screaming girls chasing them all over the streets? It's a good question to ask. So the music business preys on the young. They look for artists who are easily manipulated with a promise of superstardom and great, great riches. They're promised all of this if they just follow the advice and the formula, and the guidelines that the label music business presents to them to give them their fame and wealth. And then the music business, once the band agrees to it, music business begins to shape them and mold them into the product that they want them to be. Hence, the Beatles were leather-clad, leather jackets, leather pants, smoking, swearing on stage, hair greased back, rough-looking guys and ga- guys. And the music business came in and said, no, 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 you can get rid of all that. Get rid of all of it. You're going to wear suits. You're going to cut your hair. You're going to wear your hair the way we want you to wear your hair. You're going to wear the suits we want you to wear. You're going to speak the way we want you to speak. You're going to stop smoking on stage. You're going to play these songs. You're going to play for 40 minutes a night around these countries and these, these cities. And you're going to do it as we say. When we say jump, you say how high. That's how it worked with the people. So, so the image is carefully crafted. The record company tells them how to dress, what to sing, how to stand, what to eat, how to wear their hair, what amps they'll, they'll use, what guitars they'll play, what's, you know, what their stage and show will consist of, how long they'll play, where they will tour. They design the album covers. They decide the order of the songs on the album. They decide what songs are going to be on the album. Their image and their songs are the product. See, the members of the band become a product no different than a car in an assembly line. The record companies don't look at these people, bands, as humans. They look at them as a product, a mass-produced product that they can put on an assembly line Put different clothing and hair and music on them, send them down the line, finish them off, and roll them out, backed by you know millions of dollars of marketing money and advertising and PR. The, the musicians are used and abused, and once audiences lose interest in lose interest in them, they th- they throw these people aside like trash, like garbage, and the record company moves on to their next victim. And so basically, these band members are tricked out. They're turned out, just like the record company is the pimp. And the, and the band members are the hookers. And they use them and abuse them to make money off of them. And then when they're done beating them and, and manipulating them, they toss them aside. I don't know if they get them hooked on drugs, but somehow drugs always seem to enter the picture with musicians, probably, probably because musicians can't handle the unrealistic expectations of the record company. And they have nowhere to turn to run and hide. So they start drinking, smoking dope, shooting up, shoot, shooting up smack, things like that. And, and the prime example is this is Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was a prisoner in his entertainment world. He couldn't leave that world. He was so big and so massive, he couldn't escape it. So he withdrew into drugs and into food. And he, he eventually killed himself, allegedly. If Elvis is really dead. So, when when we talk about the Beatles not playing on their own records, there is more than enough evidence in the recording industry where studio musicians come into a recording and play on another band's records. The Wrecking Crew on the west coast of America consisted of people like Glenn Campbell, who's a well-known guitar virtuoso. And they would bring the wrecking crew in to work on different records because the band members they were playing for weren't good musicians, especially in the, st- in the studio. So the recording process in a professional studio 
is an entirely different environment than playing live in front of a group. It's entirely different. It's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different layout. It's a whole different atmosphere. And I speak from experience. The first time I stepped into a professional recording studio and the producer was behind the glass and he pointed to me, meaning we're recording, I froze. I didn't know what to do. I tried to play and you get the what's called the yips. You get really paranoid. You get really uptight. You want to play well. But it's an entirely different environment, it's an entirely different mindset. It's very hard to perform in a recording studio if you've never done it before. It's very difficult. It's it's a very different mindset. And you become very self-conscious of what you're playing. There's a lot of uh, self-talk in your head, negative self-talk. Oh, I didn't play that right. And you stop and you start and you stop and you start. And... This is why professional studios bring in studio musicians. Now, I know there were a few studio musicians who play on Beatle records. I mean, there was Andy White and Eric Clapton and Billy Preston and Bernard Purdy and the occasional orchestral musician to play on Beatle records. But when you're a recording studio, the reason why they would use studio musicians specifically on Beatle records is time equals money in a recording business. This is all about money, remember? And the goal is to invest as little money as possible in the manufacturing process of a product so you get the greatest return on your investment. And that's why U.S. US manufacturing companies offshore so many manufacturing deals to other companies for cars, steel, et cetera. The wages that they pay people offshore in other countries like Mexico or India or wherever it happens to be they're paying, they're paying some of these, these people, you know, a fraction of what they would pay someone in the United States to make a car. So the whole idea is you make the, you make the product as cheaply as possible so you can get the greatest return on investment. Enter studio musicians. So you bring the Beatles in the studio. You've got Pete Best who, who sped up and slowed down and he, wasn't, he was not a consistent drummer. And he was a, a boring drummer. He was okay, but he wasn't steady. On the drums. So, some reason they just decided to bring Ringo Starr in. I, I don't know. What, I still don't believe the story. They just happened to stumble upon Ringo Starr and he got rid of Pete. I know why they got rid of Pete because just from a musical standpoint, he wasn't very good. And then you bring Ringo in, they call him the human metronome. I don't know about that. I just don't know about that. So, regardless of, the, of where they got these drummers from, you bring in Ringo Starr. You bring in John Paul, Jordan, and Ringo in the studio, and they're not precise players. When you go into a studio, you've got to knock the songs out as quickly as possible, even in today's business. The idea is to invest as little money as possible in the initial recordings, the initial investment in the band, so you make the most money on, on, on the other side on the back end. On the front end, if you're putting too much money into it, if you go in to the studio with John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and they can't seem to get away from having the yips in the studio, and they keep making mistakes, and they have to do take after take after take after take, the money's piling up. The studio is spending more and more money on these four idiots that can't seem to figure out how to play in a recording studio. I, I guarantee it. I guarantee it especially when they were very young and never been in a recording studio. Like, like in front of George Martin, this is, one of the, this is a huge record company, EMI, George Martin. And, and they, you just can't waltz into a recording studio and knock out these songs like they allegedly did for their first album. I think they say they knocked out Please Please Me. I, I think, I might be wrong, but I think they knocked it out in like 12 hours or something. Come on, guys. I mean, if you believe that, I mean, granted, like three quarters of the songs in the album were cover songs. They were they were other people's music. It wasn't original music. Uh, if you believe that, then I again, I've got some swamp land for you in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix. I'll sell to you for a good price. So they bring in studio musicians because music is about precision in the record in the, in the professional music business. It's about precision. I have to play quick precisely get the songs out like that boom 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 
tank, the fewer tanks as possible. If you bring somebody into a studio, I didn't, I'm, Glenn Campbell didn't play in the Beatles records as far as you know, but let's say you bring somebody in like Glenn Campbell to play guitar for George Harrison. Glenn Campbell was a guitar virtuoso. These studio musicians know their instruments inside and out. They're, they're virtuosos. They're geniuses at what they do musically. They don't make a lot of mistakes if they make any mistakes at all. And they can knock out a song within like a couple of minutes and have it down. Okay. So it's saving the record company money. They're paying them a union wage. So many dollars an hour to come in and play. So many, so many dollars an hour to come in and play on a record. So it saves the money. So you, you sit John Paul George and Ringo down, put him in a corner with a cup of tea, and you bring in a, quote, Glenn Campbell to play George and John's art. You bring in a virtuoso bass player to play like Paul, so on and so forth. You bring in a drummer like Andy White to play the drums because they're precise, you know, precise players. You, you, you need the drummer to play consistently on the beat or in front of the beat or behind the beat. You need to and have them hit the drum skins with the same with the same um, energy each time because the engineer is sitting in the room with with headphones on, going, "Oh no, no, the drums are too loud. Now they're too soft." Because back then, especially, you're you're recording to tape, you're recording to magnetic tape, and there's no way they could go back in and adjust it like you can today in a digital platform. You you had to go in, if if the drummer is playing too loud on certain parts. He's playing too soft on others. It's all mic'd in the studio. So if if there's an inconsistency in the level playing, there's no way to fix it in post. You can try, but it's going to sound mur murky and muddy and nasty and distorted. So you need musicians to come in and play consistently with their guitars, their bass, and the drums. It 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 only makes perfectly good sense, especially back then when. You ha they had no way to really fix it in post. They didn't have the digital artificial intelligence like you have today to fix all those things. So the reason you bring in professional studio musicians is professionalism. You've got studio musicians who are usually highly skilled virtuoso musicians that bring a level of professionalism and ex expertise to the recording session, cutting back costs and time to record the songs. You have efficiency. Student musicians are accustomed to working in recording environments and are often able to quickly and efficiently lay down tracks, saving money for the recording studio. Saves time during the recording process compared to working with less experienced or unfamiliar, unfamiliar musicians like the Beatles. They have versatility. So uh, student musicians are accustomed to working in recording environments and are often able to quickly and efficiently lay down tracks of different genres of music, save time during the recording process compared to working with the experienced or unfamiliar musicians like the Beatles. So if you want them to play a bossa nova, they play a bossa nova. You want to play, you know, a cha-cha, they know how to play a cha-cha. If, if they want them to play a ballad, they know how to play a ballad. If you want them to play Rock and roll, they know how to play rock and roll. If you need somebody to play piano, they play piano. If you want someone to play harmonica, they play harmonica. And I, and I do find it curious that John Lennon, the first two albums, I think, with the Beatles and Please Please Me, there was harmonica. But after that, I'm trying to think later on, I don't think he had any more harmonica. They took it out. I wonder why. Allegedly, he could really play well. Um, they're versatile, they're consistent on their playing. And they're available. Session musicians are available. They're on contract with the with recording studio to be available. They play, they paid them a union wage. The Beatles weren't always available. When they got really famous, the Beatles were everywhere. They were in photo shoots. They were making movies. They were touring around the world. Now back then, touring was different than it is now. I mean, they were hitting multiple countries in North America and in Europe flying all over the place. This, is the, I think this is probably the first time in history that a band really did this. I, I don't know what Sinatra and Elvis did. But they weren't available to record these songs. There wasn't time to go in the session, go in the studio and record a whole song a, a, on top of writing it and coming up with the riffs, like you know, like the riffs to 
uh, Ticket to Ride and Day Tripper and Paperback Rider. I mean, how did they pull these riffs just right out of their ass? A couple of, a bunch of scrubby musicians. And some student musicians have specialized skills and are expertise in certain instrument or playing style. Record companies can bring in these musicians to enhance special aspects of the recording. And it's cost effective. This is saving the record company millions of dollars annually. Even today, they bring them in. It's, it's, not, it's not an unheard of practice. It's very common. It is the best and most efficient way to make a record. So let me ask you this. If you were the CEO of a record company, or let, let's say if you were the CEO of GM, General, General Motors, and you had an engineer bring you a design of a new car that you had on paper looked ugly, unsafe, it didn't look reliable. Would you invest in that as the new model for 2024 to boost your sales? I mean, no. I mean, it, it's not something you would do. You would tell them to go back to the drawing board and redesign the vehicle. Now, once it's approved and you get a good, solid, safe, designed and engineered product, you think it's your gem and you think it's your baby. It's going to make the company millions of dollars in 2024. You send it to be assembled on an assembly line by your least experienced assembly line workers to build the car? No. no. You'd give the car to the best on the line to ensure that it's the best manufactured vehicle to come out come out of the factory as quickly as possible. And, and so it rolls out off the assembly line into showrooms across the country. So you start making sales and it's safe for people. So it's just not far-fetched. The, the Beatles didn't have time to write songs. I mean, how did they go? You've got to ask yourself this question too. How did these guys go from songs like Love Me Do, which kind of plods along as lifeless and dull, to Please Please Me. I want to hold your hand. She loves you. It's a completely different style of writing. It's an entirely different than what they were doing on stage. Now, I think one of their songs, Ask Me Why, is like a ballad, a schmaltzy ballad, not well written. The lyrics are insipid. Same with Love Me Do. I mean, I'm so sorry. I hate that song, Love Me Do. I've never been a fan of it. Even when I was a kid, I'd hear it like, Love, Love Me Do. You no, know I love you. So please, Love Me Do. What? It's like, uh, it's like, what? What? I mean, really, the lyrics are awful. They're, they're just terrible. Compared to what was on the radio in America at the time, they're awful. So they somehow went from Love Me Do to Last night I said these words to my girl. Da, 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 da. I know you. there's an entirely different style of writing. Um, my theory, you know, and I can't speak for Mike Williams, but my theory is that that they had ghostwriters. This is this is Mike's theory. This is not my own theory. Mike came up with this, but my theory is that, that George Martin had access to staff ghostwriters. Said, "Look, boys, um, we've got this new band. They call themselves the Beatles, <laughs> um, and uh, we need some songs for them. So, what can you come up with?" And these guys sat down with them and tried to come up with some songs for them that might be popular. I think one of the songs they, I don't think the Beatles wrote, um, How Do You Do It? I don't think the Beatles wrote that. I, I think it was given to them to sing, but they tossed it and, and replaced it with Please Please Me If I'm Correct. And the style, think about the style of writing. You go from Love Me Do to Please Please Me. Go from please, please me to I'm going to hold your hand to she loves you. And all of a sudden, after she loves you, that whole style of music is gone. And you go to records here in, in the States, like Beatles 65, which I think it was, uh, it's just a pile of just manufactured puppy dogs, rainbows, and unicorn stories. It's no different than Taylor Swift, which, I, you know, I've already tapped into Taylor Swift a little bit myself. But it's all designed about money. And if you really put all the pieces together and you really think about it, it only makes sense that the style of writing, nothing matches up. They change their style, their musical style, 
from album to album. I mean, I think the closest thing you get to hearing the real Beatles is their first album. And maybe Let It Be. But but they changed so much. You mean they just happened to be sitting around smoking dope and dropping asses going, Hey, man. Like, you know, dude, maybe we should write a song for an album, you know, like, uh, here, there, and everywhere. Oh, man, that's a great title, dude. Oh, yeah, I mean, come on. They just happened to write here, there, and everywhere in 1966, and then all of a sudden jump up and come up with Sgt. Pepper's just a few months later. I mean, that that's like, that's beyond being geniuses. Like, they're all Einstein musicians that just can come up with this crazy, weird sound all of a sudden out of the blue. Within six months of each other, uh, that's insane. As an artist myself, as a painter, a writer, a poet, a movie maker, a photographer myself, to change styles like that so drastically in such a short period of time is impossible, guys. It's, it's impossible. And maybe the record companies haven't been able to recreate it because they haven't been able to get the same ghostwriters in the room or, or, you know, they haven't been able to convince anybody to do it again because a lot of these people who wrote the music for the Beatles saw how famous the songs got and all they got was a union wage and they said, screw it, we're not doing it again. And we want more money. So they probably either fired those songwriters or they offed them or something. But that, that's the premise behind it. See, it and then when, when Mike Williams and I talk about this stuff, it's not because we hate the Beatles or we're jealous of them or jealous of their money. I mean, this is because we've misled. We talk about it because we've misled. That's what they do. They make products to mislead us so we'll spend our money on it. It's about putting us into a trance. It's about, it's about tricking us into forking over our dough. It's not about making us feel good. It just happens to be a side effect of the music. You happen to feel good Trust me, the Beatles were my saviors. The Beatles were my Christ when I was a little kid. I didn't know who Christ was. The Beatles were all I had, all I clung to. I had two drunk parents and siblings that didn't get a shit, shit about me. And they all took off and left me with two drunk parents and my Beatle records. That's all I had to hope for and cling to. So when I discovered that the Beatles were potentially a big, phony bunch of idiots, I went, whoa, this is this is really sobering. And then when you start to look at this, you see how it's everywhere. It's not just music. Most of the stuff that we consume and that we buy is garbage. The cars, the books, the phones, the laptops, the TVs, the houses, it's all garbage. It's stuff we don't really need to survive. That's why we talk about it. It's all a psyops. It's all a psyops to control us and trick us and keep us hypnotized. So we, we'll be quiet. We'll be pacified. We won't rise up against both them. That's what it's all about. And they've done a really good job without firing a shot of taking over our minds and our bodies. And that's what it's all about. And that's why we talk about it. I, again, I can't speak for Mike. I can speak for myself. This is why I talk about it. I try to talk about the truth. My videos started talking about call centers and the corporate world. Because the call centers in the corporate world are the biggest lie in the world. They, they basically wage slaves to these companies. For men that came up with a product that the public is buying, but they're, they're paying all of you peanuts while they sit on a 100-foot yacht in the Bahamas with their, with their sexual mistress or their leather mistress and their you know, snorting coke and uh, skin diving for uh, sand dollars. I, I don't know what, what people do. I've known a few rich people in my life. So there you have it. That's my take on the music business. Take it or leave it, but do some research. You'll, you'll find out that much of what I, we all talk about re related to this is the truth. So I'm PT Pop on a Mind Revolution. Again, if you're interested in supporting this channel, check out my Patreon channel. And I bid you adieu. Avi Zane. Bye-bye. Bye, Bonds. Would you like fries with that? Would you like fries with that?